In the early 19th century, scientists didn't think in terms of energy. They thought in terms of individual powers or forces. These were all disconnected, unrelated things. The power of the wind, the force of a door closing, the crack of lightning. The idea that there might be some sort of overarching, unifying energy which lay behind all these forces had yet to be revealed. One lowly man's drive to understand the hidden mysteries of nature would begin to change all that. Young Michael Faraday hated his job. He was uneducated, the son of a blacksmith. He'd been lucky to become a bookbinder's apprentice. But Faraday craved one thing. He craved knowledge. He read every book that passed through his hands. He developed a passion for science. All of his free time and his meager wages were poured into his self-education. He was on the threshold of an incredible journey into the invisible world of energy. Faraday had impressed one of his master's customers and was rewarded with a ticket that would change his life. Excuse me, please. Can I pass, please? Can I pass? Some of us are trying to improve ourselves. If people will let us... Of course, of course. Pass, pass. This way to a better life. <laughs> <coughs> In the early 1800s, science was a pursuit of gentlemen something Faraday was clearly not. He had a rudimentary education, he'd read widely, he'd gone to public lectures. But in 1812, he was given tickets to hear Sir Humphrey Davy, the most prominent chemist of the age. <laughs> 19th century scientists were the pop stars of their day. Their lectures were hugely popular. <laughs> Tickets were hard to come by, and Davy reveled in his status. They're waiting. I knew. He was also a keen follower of the latest fashion, nitrous oxide or laughing gas. He said it had all the benefits of alcohol without the hangover. City, ladies and gentlemen, a mysterious force that can unravel the confusing mixture of intermingled substances that surround us and produce pure, pure elements. How do we... Davy was an absolutely first-rate scientist. However, many will come to say that his greatest discovery is Michael Faraday. Metals unknown, that is, until I isolated potassium from molten potash and sodium, as I showed you last time, from common salt. That same magical... Faraday may not have been born a gentleman, but he wasn't going to let class barriers stop him from pursuing a career in science. He worked for nights on end to bind his lecture notes into a book for his new hero. Lord, help me to think only of others, to be of use to mankind. Help me be part of the great circle that is your work and love. Lord, I am your servant. Well, this is excellent work, Faraday. So what is it you aim to do with your life? My desire, sir, is to escape from trade, which I find vicious and selfish and to become a servant of science, which I imagine makes its pursuers amiable and liberal. <laughs> really? Well, I shall leave it to the experience of a few years to set you right on that score. Look, I haven't anything at the moment. I'll send a note if anything comes up. Despite this humiliating setback, Faraday was determined to break free from his daily toil. His patience, 
was rewarded. Michael Faraday, he's going to be my helper while I recover. He assures me he is a Christian fellow. Perhaps with God and Faraday in charge of the chemicals, you and I will be safe in our place of work. Thank you, Professor Davy. Welcome, Faraday. Oh, no, thank you, and thank you, Sir Humphrey. Just stick to your job and do as you're told, and you'll be fine, Faraday. Faraday became the laboratory assistant, eagerly absorbing every scrap of knowledge that Davy deigned to impart. But in time, the pupil would surpass the master. The big excitement of the day was electricity. Another charge, Newman. The battery had just been invented, and all manner of experiments were being done. But no one really understood what this strange force of electricity was. The academic establishment at the time thought that electricity was, you know, like a fluid flowing through a pipe, pushing its way along. But in 1821, a Danish researcher showed that when you pass an electrical current through a wire and place a compass near it, it deflected the needle at right angles. This was the first time researchers had seen electricity affect a magnet. The first glimpse of two forces which had previously been seen as entirely separate, now unified in some inexplicable way. Faraday, come look at this. Another bright spark around here, perhaps you can work it out. Ersted's reported an amazing finding. We're just replicating it here. Let's try the compass on the other side. Now that is remarkable. But if the electrical force is flowing through the wire, why does the needle not move in the same direction, parallel to the wire? Quite. Let's try turning the whole apparatus round. Again, Newman. So, the electrical force goes this way, the compass points that way. How can one affect the other? Perhaps the electricity is throwing out some invisible force as it moves along. What? Perhaps some sort of electrical force is emanating outwards from the wire. Well, my dear boy, let me tell you that at the University of Cambridge, electricity flows through a wire not sideways to it. Well, that may be what they teach at Cambridge, but it doesn't explain what's happening before our eyes. No, no, let's just get on. Let's swap the compass to below the wire. Why the compass was deflected at right angles, why the electricity was affecting the compass at all, dumbfounded Davy and many others. As we celebrate the marriage of Michael and Sarah. For Faraday, however, the problem became an obsession. It was a fascination inspired by his religion. For him, the problem was a way to understand God's hidden mysteries. There is a small, almost persecuted group in London called the Sandemanians. They were religious, not really a sect. They were just a small subset, sort of like Quakers. Faraday was a member of that group. It was a very gentle, decent group. They believed that underneath the whole surface of reality, Everything was created by God in a unified way, that if you opened up one little part of it, you could see how everything was connected. Michael Faraday was someone who, like Einstein, thought in terms of pictures. Faraday was different from anybody else. He had a flair for understanding his experiments, for understanding what was really going on inside them. By methodically placing a compass all around an electrified wire, Faraday started to notice a pattern. What everyone else at the time had been taught was that forces travel in straight lines. Faraday was different. 
Faraday imagined that invisible lines of force flowed around an electric wire. And then he imagined that a magnet had similar lines emerging from it, and that those lines would get caught up in this flow. It was a bit like a flag in a wind. But Faraday's great leap of imagination was to turn this experiment on its head. Instead of an electrified wire moving a compass needle, he wondered if he could get a static magnet to move a wire. I've never seen you like this, Faraday. <laughs> you look like a happy child. <laughs> I'm shaking, Newman. Underneath, I'm shaking. <laughs> you see, John? You see? Yes. <laughs> This is the experiment of the century. It's the invention of the electric motor. Scale up the magnets and the wires, make them really big. Attach heavy weights to them, and they'll be dragged along. But almost more importantly, he's inventing a new kind of physics here. Although he didn't realize it at the time, Faraday had also just demonstrated an overarching principle. The chemicals in the battery had been transformed into electricity in the wire, which had combined with the magnet to produce motion. Behind all these various forces, there was a common energy. A couple of months earlier, Davy had been elected president of the Royal Society, which was the elite body of English science. But then he saw this great discovery published in the Quarterly Journal of Science. I don't know if he was envious, but he certainly saw that this young man who had been his assistant, this mere blacksmith's son, had come up with one of the greatest discoveries of the Victorian era. Davy accuses Faraday of plagiarizing similar work from another eminent British scientist, William Wollaston. So, Faraday, what does Wollaston make of all this? He's written to me and assures me that he's taken no offense. And he acknowledges that what I published was entirely my own work. Right, right. Davy is just being an ass. But will Davy now retract his allegation? Sadly, no. In fact, he's still vehemently opposed to you being elected a member of the society. Really? And what do you think? Faraday, my dear boy, you have my vote. And mine. And I believe you even have Wollstones. <laughs> oh. What a mess. Well, no matter. No matter. It's the science that counts. So tell me, how does this wire of yours spin round its magnet? What mysterious forces are at play? There seems to be an electromagnetic interaction. In my mind, I see a, a swirling array of lines of force spinning out of the electrified wire, like a spiraling web. But invisible lines of force, it's all a bit vague, isn't it? Faraday, might I have a word in private? Certainly. Listen, Faraday, let's stop this nonsense. I want you to take down your ballot paper from the notice board. Sir Humphrey, I see no reason to take it down. My friends have proposed me. It is they who put the paper up. I will not take it down. Good day. Faraday was elected to the Royal Society. Davy died five years later, a victim of his many gaseous inhalations. In time, Faraday's world of invisible forces would lead to a whole new understanding of energy. He'd started what Einstein would call the Great Revolution.